Hey guys, Woodruff here. Um, so now we're going to talk about cold related emergencies and there's two different ones. There's frostbite and there's hypothermia. And I'll probably split these up into two different um, very short videos uh, because um, frostbite and hypothermia, like with the heat related disorders, they are different, but they have like pretty much the same, a lot of the same treatments or like they're very similar. Um, whereas um, with cold related emergencies, frostbite and hypothermia are similar, but different. Um, for cold related emergencies in general, the risk factors are going to be somewhat similar to heat related in that, you know, the very old and very young are going to be more at risk for the cold related disorders. Um, if they have prolonged exposure, like if they live in an area um, where it's colder, if they're homeless, um, you know, um, I think the guy that I usually talk about, like he, his um, heater went out when we had one of those um, years in Texas where it was actually really cold. Um, so stuff like that. Then also diabetes and vascular disease is going to put the person at risk because it's a flow thing. Um, you know, we need warm blood going to our extremities. If we don't have, we have like vasoconstriction, um, broken down blood vessels, poor flow issues, it's going to affect them, um, which is also smokers. The vasoconstriction can lead there. And then um, alcohol intoxication can also put you more at risk. And it's kind of some of them all go together. So I usually tell the story of the guy um, and he was hypothermic and I'll talk more about him when I get to hypothermia, but the guy that, you know, he decided to, um, uh, what do you call it? He had to choose between buying alcohol or um, paying his heat bill um, that was due and he decided on the alcohol. And so as a result, he, um, had a multiple factors. He ended up, he was in an apartment where again, it was super cold, like one of the coldest um, Texas winters. Um, and um, at least that, that was at that point, because now Texas has decided to get moody. So he was in a cold environment. He was drinking lots of alcohol because he said, hey, this will warm me up. Alcohol, it, when you drink, it feels like it's warming you up, but it's not actually doing that. Um, and um, uh, what do you call it? Um, he also probably, had, I think he had a history, he was a smoker, had a history of other um, diseases as well. So it was kind of like a, a trifecta, but yeah, that's just the beginning for that. But first we're going to talk about, if I can ever get there, frostbite. So, um, and frostbite is effectively, it's, it's a little different. Uh, it's different than hypothermia because hypothermia is like a full body thing where frostbite is more of a localized reaction. Um, and it's where your tissue actually gets frozen. Um, the stress from the cold can, causes constriction in your blood vessels, which leads to less flow. So that's why this is most common in the hands and the feet. It can also um, appear on the cheeks, the nose, the ears, like you'll a lot of times see the nose, the nose and the ears, like on um, TV shows. And I was very surprised when your book said that it also, um, uh, you know, it commonly can happen in the genitals, but I guess it makes sense. So uh, it can be superficial or deep. And we're not going to test you too deep on the difference here. We're not going to be like, here's these symptoms. Is that this is superficial or is this a deep injury? Because um, that's not necessarily really helpful. We treat it pretty similarly. Um, to know what the difference looks like, um, just, you know, because more than anything, you want to think about like how severe is this? You would expect if it was a superficial frostbite for their skin to be waxy and pale, their skin may be um, yellow or it could be blue and mottled and um, or dusky kind of looking um, like really think that blue color. The skin is actually going to feel crunchy and frozen. Um, and um, they can have some paresthesias, like some numbness, tingling, and burning. So remember, all of this shows that, like, I mean, even though the color is not good, there's decreased flow, and then they have the paresthesias because their nerves are obviously being affected. Um, when it's deep, the skin gets to the point where it's white, um, it's hard, and then they don't feel anything. Because this is the point, if it's getting deep, um, you know, like it's getting past those nerves where um, now like they're completely frozen, they're not feeling anything. So at least with a superficial, even though they're having the paresthesias, they're still feeling something. So it's just showing the depth of the injury. Um, now, I have a lot of assessments here, but I've starred the ones that are probably the most important because these are going to be similar to what we're going to want to do for hypothermia. But keep in mind, like this is more of a localized thing. So a patient that has frostbite, it's very unlikely that just their fingers or toes were hanging out in a very cold area and the rest of them is warm. 
Um, so, um, you know, we do want to kind of do general assessments to see, because people could have hypothermia and frostbite. So we want to see like, what's their mental status? What's their temperature? What's their vital signs, their blood pressure, their heart rate, the respiratory rate, all that. Um, but more importantly, we want to, since this is a local thing, we want to check their skin. Um, we want to ask about their pain and then also do a good peripheral neurovascular. I know you're probably wondering like, how do you do cap refill on these patients? You don't, you're not going to be pressing on those, um, you know, crunchy toes, um, but um, you're going to look for the closest pulse that you can find to see how low, how like how far down flow goes. And you're going to be checking, um, you know, regularly for improvements in those. So it's better if you have an improved neurovascular assessment or signs that the flow is better. If their temperature is better. Um, this is more of a local thing. So, you know, we're going to be concerned if tissue is dying or not getting flow, that infection could set in. So we definitely want no signs of infection. And we want their pain and other symptoms to be manageable, where it's definitely worse if their neurovascular assessment is declining or worsening, if their temperature is decreasing. Um, if there's any signs of dead tissue, infection, I know their toes and, or hands, you know, can always look bad. Um, but definitely if there's, um, uh, we call it, there, it, definitely you can start to tell when it's not getting any better. Um, and then any increase in, increasing or worsening of their pain or symptoms. All right. So here, before we get into treatment, let's talk about what we might do. So for each of the following prescriptions, indicate whether they're contraindicated, indicated, or unnecessary for a client with frostbite. So first one is put bear hugger or a heater on a client. So this might sound good, um, but actually with people with frostbite, we don't necessarily do as much of the dry heat as we like the moist heat, because this is a skin issue and the dry heat isn't necessarily going to be helpful to them. Now, if this was a hypothermia patient, this would be great because, um, you know, keep in mind too with the bear hugger, like usually bear hugger, we're trying to warm their whole body and people with frostbite, um, you know, it's more of a localized. So we're, we're looking for something more specific. I don't think this would, I don't necessarily think this would hurt a patient, um, but it's not really going to help them either. So I was going to, I'm going to say more, it's unnecessary. Um, elevate the affected extremity. So most people are going to say contraindicated, um, but I would actually say that this is indicated. It's good. So um, people get confused about this because they're like, oh man, like if you do that, it's going to worsen the flow. And you're right that usually elevation worsens flow because you guys are thinking like compartment syndrome and stuff like that. And you're right with compartment syndrome, we do not elevate. But here's the thing is, is that this is kind of like in a fracture where the first 24 to 48 hours we elevate to decrease swelling. These people do have decreased or issues with flow, but we really need to decrease that edema because the swelling that happens um, with frost Spite is going to make it even worse where it's going to start kind of pushing inward. So with, with compartment syndrome, do not elevate um, anything like that. But for frostbite, we like elevation. Um, elevation is going to decrease that swelling. Utilize warm soaks and baths. Um, this is something that is good. It's indicated. Um, so we like warm soaks and baths. Let's say it's their feet. We might put it in a little foot bathtub um, and um, something like that or wrap them in um, warm or moist, um, you know, um, light wraps and things like that. Um, but we usually like, we like to put it in something moist versus that dry heat. Um, place heavy blankets on the client. So this might be something that you're like, oh, they may be cold. That would be good. Um, but we really, this is a skin issue and this can actually slough, like their, their tissue could, um, I don't want to say slough, slough off sounds a little um, extreme, but it could definitely, we're really worried about hurting their skin. Um, and they have this crunchy, very, um, very sensitive skin. So we want to avoid any sort of um, anything constrictive or anything that's heavy on the client. Um, provide pain medications prior to wound care. Um, so, so far, let me real quick, bear hugger, probably unnecessary, elevate necessary or in, sorry, elevate is indicated, utilize warm soak, indicated, heavy blankets, contraindicated. So pain medicine prior to wound care. Um, this is going to be something that is helpful. These people can have a lot of pain. It's almost like a burn um, where we have like, they can be sometimes like screaming, like really, really, really painful. Um, depends on the level of the, of the um, frostbite and stuff like that. But pain medicine prior to wound care is indicated. Um, evaluate their tetanus vaccination status. So this is one of the few things that this section, um, what do you call them, that you are going to definitely need to 
check their tetanus status. So tetanus, remember, people at risk for tetanus are going to be those that have open fractures, those with frostbite, um, and those that are like exposed to um, uh, dirty needles or have dirty wounds, gardeners, things like that. Um, so you always with a frost uh, with a patient that has frostbite, you want to evaluate their tetanus vaccination status. And then just based on when the last time they got their um, tetanus vaccine, then that's where you would decide whether they needed to um, uh, get a booster or any other sort of treatment. So that is indicated. Place a continuous temperature monitor. So some people may say yes, but remember the problem with this patient isn't really a systemic temperature issue. It's a localized issue. So most of this really think extremity, peripheral neurovascular, infection, like real, that's where really where we're focused. Um, like where it's all about flow perfusion to an extremity versus like systemic temperature. Now they might have other issues, but that doesn't actually treat the frostbite. So this is going to be unnecessary. Is it going to hurt the patient? No, but is it going to help them? Probably not. All right, so overall, like I said, it's all about skin infection prevention and um, regulating the temperature of their extremity or wherever it is affected. Um, so big things, do not squeeze, massage, or scrub the area. Their, ten, their, ten, their skin is so sensitive, so you want to be super careful with it. Remove all constrictive clothing and jewelry. And this is just a good measure. Like if you're taking care of a patient and they come in and they have a ring on, it's fitting fine. Almost everyone swells up and stuff like that due to positioning in the hospital. So if they're willing to, um, or if, you know, if they're not willing to consent, but, you know, um, you, you know that it's something they're really high risk for swelling. Um, I usually take all my patient's jewelry off from the hospital, go put it into the safe or give it to a family member to bring home um, because it's just such it's such a risk either to be lost um, or for there to be problems it's not fun to try to get off a ring that's stuck on a patient um, so any sort of constrictive clothing or jewelry, the wound care, um, we're going to do really thorough wound care and remember that pain management before tetanus prophylaxis if needed um, and elevation. And remember elevation helps because it decreases the swelling, which allows for better flow. So it's kind of like, wait, even though it seems like it would make things harder at first by decreasing the swelling, we're going to help things out. So yes, elevation for frostbite, no elevation for compartment syndrome. Um, and then like we mentioned, uh, immerse it in warm water. All right. The next video will be about hypothermia. See you there.